welcome to this episode of Getting to Know Your Indiana Neighbor. And if you were at Ligoti High School between the years of 1973 and 1983, you're going to know this guy. And, and you might know him anyway. Uh, he, he's an author. We'll talk about these books that he has authored. And uh, we're going to find out what he's been up to for the last 40 years. It turns out plenty. But our Indiana neighbor today is Dr. Randy Mills. Thanks for coming down. Hey, I'm looking forward. Yeah, so we got a lot to talk about. In fact, I, I kind of think of you as, if you wanted to, a replacement for the Dos Equis guy as the most interesting man in the world. Now, that's short for, we're going to need some time here, so uh, make sure that you give us plenty of time. You're, you're an Indiana neighbor, but you're not a Hoosier. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. <clears throat> I grew up in southern Illinois. Uh, in the Mount Vernon Fairfield area, but, but out in the sticks, uh, there's no town or village within 20 miles of where I grew up. It was all farmland. And uh, there was a culture there of uh, a couple of churches, some country stores, a little uh, grade school. I went to a grade school, much like Rutherford, mm -hmm. that had uh, eight grades and three rooms. All right, great. And, it, and it still exists today. My, my, uh, the building uh, exists. No, no, the school. My sister wow. just retired from it. And it was about a half a mile down the road. We walked every day. Uh, so very, very rural setting. I uh, went to a uh, small high school, probably had about 100 students when I was there. Um, my family farmed. Now, my father worked in town, and, but most farmers had two jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, they worked at the car shops, oral oil oil fields, uh, different places. Uh, my father was a car salesman in a, for a big dealership there in Mount Vernon, Illinois. Yeah, so he was a... So you were near Mount Vernon. I was trying to place... Yes, yes, place. yes. Mount, Mount Vernon would have been the county seat of Jefferson County. All right. And in that county, there were uh, Mount Vernon High School and then these three little high schools, my size. Mm -hmm. uh, Southern Illinois, uh, and all of Illinois, has been slow to consolidate. And those high schools are still out there. Uh, so... A little, little bit different than Indiana, we had this consolidation. So when I was in grade school, and, and earlier on, back up a little bit, I had a brother 11 months older than me that was very good at farming. I think he was driving a tractor when he was seven. And, <laughs> and we farmed with our grand, grandfather. Yeah. And it was really great and, uh, to do that sort of thing because you were outdoors all the time. Uh, he was very good at it. I was not. Yeah. I liked to read. Uh, I was more into my head, kind of spacey. Um, not good at driving tractors. I might go in a ditch while I'm thinking Probably about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Civil War and stuff like that. I'm very interested in history yeah. uh, at that time. So uh, I got left out in the beginning until uh, I got old enough to haul hay, and I ended up being very good at that. I, were, I, you, were you bigger than your brother? Even uh, you yeah, I got, thank God, I got bigger than him because yeah. being just 11 months older and my mother then had a, uh, our little sister uh, when I was two. So she couldn't take care of us and, and he was pretty aggressive toward me. So that began, I, I was not naturally a fighter, but I learned to do that sort of thing. And I got bigger than him more quickly. So he was kind of a playmate, dear friend adversary for, for years, but we just had two much different paths in our lives and where we went. So we were never very competitive uh, once we got into school. So uh, once uh, I got big enough to work in the hay field, um, I got good at that. And I started lifting weights, too, uh, when I was in eighth grade. Eighth grade. Yeah, and that's going to be a part of our story because it's very interesting to me, Greg, that when I see Ligoti students, I see them on Facebook or so forth, and I always talk about the, how strong I was and bending the quarter. I know you, you did. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. just real quick. Uh, I've got a quarter here, and I'm going to tease you for a moment because a lot of the Facebook comments were, I wonder if you can still bend a quarter. Well, we'll put that aside. Yes, okay. We'll leave that down. We'll, leave it. we'll come back to that if we have time. Yeah. <laughs> if we have time. If we have time. Continue. So uh, part of the reason for that, and, and this gets me into basketball, and it's going to bring me into the uh, – the story about when I came to Lagodi, eventually here, how things, uh, you look back and you see all the connections. So uh, I, I was strong enough to work in the hay fields and did very well at that. I have a, an unpublished autobiography, and I was going to call it uh, 
not like your father's people <laughs> because my mother was from around there and that uh, area was my dad's people. And that wasn't a compliment, by the way, with old farms. You're not like your father's people. No, you're, probably not. You know, you're like your mom. You like to read books and things. Uh, but uh, I've changed that to King of the Hayfields because that's where I got my confidence and, and kind of my initiation of manhood there. I couldn't do it driving tractors and fixing tractors, yeah. but it was very strong. But there's a side light to this. So I go to this little grade school. Um, there were three kids in, uh, in one room there, sixth, seventh, and eighth. We had a basketball team. And the year I was a seventh grader, there were enough eighth graders that there was a starting five. That would have been my brother. So I did not play varsity basketball that year. I played junior varsity. And I think our varsity team won one game. And that was against, uh, no, that was my eighth grade year. They did beat one of the better teams in the county in one of those games where they couldn't miss. Uh, and I talk about that in, in my uh, uh autobiography about basketball playing for my senior year uh, team. So uh, my eighth grade year, we won one game. And that was against a small Catholic team in Mount Vernon. We didn't have an indoor. <laughs> there, there was hardly a Catholic presence in, in that county, but that was yeah. the, the one team we beat. And uh, I was, had gotten a lot of my growth then. I always had, always had these really long arms, which I'll come to that theme. <laughs> That's a theme in my book as well. So I could get rebounds, and I was big for my age, too. So I could get rebounds and keep putting them back in until I scored. So I ended up being, I think, the, the leading scorer among all the little grade schools outside of Mount Vernon, which there were 16 of them. I mean, there was a scad of these grade schools, and we had a, a, a county tournament. And so I was the leading scorer. And I didn't know that. My cousin told me, he said, I think you're the leading scorer. She kept track of all that stuff. And she had another cousin in a, a, a team that had a really good team. So... Uh, that year, and the coach worked with me a little bit for pivot shots and things, but I, I didn't have very many skills. The, my uh, dad and my grandfather did put a goal out uh, in our garage. It was, it was lower. It's probably about four inches short because I can dunk on it. And, and that wasn't good for me, except uh, when I play other people, I got where I could time the shot and block it going up. So I did, have, I did get some skills that I brought with me just from repetition. So my freshman year, my brother's playing junior varsity basketball. Our little high school was varsity and junior varsity. You didn't have a freshman team. And he wasn't starting or anything. Freshmen typically didn't start because you had sophomores and juniors that weren't playing varsity. There. So I came into one of the practices and the high school coach saw me. And I was about six foot tall and in the sixth grade, pretty big with it. And he said, uh, he told my brother to go up there and have me to come down. He wanted to measure me. So I, I thought he was going to measure my height. Yeah. He measured me fingertip to fingertip. Oh, okay. I was six, nine and a half. Because <laughs> if you're in proportion, you've seen that, was it the Da Vinci thing? Of a, yeah. You're supposed to be the height of your wing, wing span. And so the coach said, oh my gosh, you're, you're going to be six, six. <laughs> and so he told my dad to start bringing me in. And he brought in one of his better former shoot, uh, shooters who was playing college ball to teach me how to shoot a jump shot and some pivot moves. And I'm indebted to that guy for, for doing that because he really worked with me. And I thought, wow, I'm getting some recognition now from my dad, some attention. Yeah. And of course, basketball is a big deal in Southern Illinois as it is in Indiana. So uh, uh, coach said to my dad, get these guys lifting weights. So we started lifting weights. We took them out to our barn. We had a hay bale for a bench. And I, my brother lifted one time and he was done with it. And I loved it. I loved the sound of those clicking of the barbells lifting up. And I, and I saw uh, results very quickly. So my freshman year, there was a really good freshman coming in from, from the little village where the high school was, Bluford. And they had a very good, they probably had the best uh, Kyla Lee Cavanaugh of, of our area. Mm -hmm. and those teams like won what they called the state tournament, which is Southern Illinois. I mean, they were very good. He's producing very good teams, but they didn't have a big guy for the middle. So I was that big guy in the middle. And so we all came up that freshman year and it had us five as starters. And we won almost every one of our games. Uh, as five freshmen? As five freshmen, oh, junior varsity. Yeah, so there I am. Never, I'd been in one game where we won a game, and now I'm, I'm in this rare era where we're winning, and people are coming to our games and packing 
because we're the future, right? And there's another class behind us that's just as good. And, uh, and then people are leaving when the varsity game starts. Oh my. So uh, my sophomore year, and we're all excited, our coach quits. Well, he doesn't quit teaching, but he quits coaching because he's got a couple little kids and he wants to spend time with them. So now we've got a new coach who's going to be varsity and junior varsity coach as it is in these little high schools. And we're sophomores and there's, I think, seven seniors. So we're not going to start. So we kind of get together and talk about it. Okay, let's not try to make varsity. Let's stay another year in junior varsity and get real good for a junior year. But then we're going to have these other guys coming up. And we're going to be really good. So we were in practice, and the, the new coach didn't know anyone from anybody. And I was playing, and I went up for a rebound, and I came down, and there were four guys on the floor because <laughs> I like to spread out. Now, there's another story there that I talk about in this book of how I got to be a rough player. My brother, who wasn't, wasn't interested in sports when we play basketball on our home, on our home court, uh, he, he would get two by fours and they would guard me with two by fours because I was just so much better than the, the, the rural people around there. So I got, yeah. I was used to getting hit by two by fours and going, going up, you know, for rebounds and things. So anyway, <laughs> the, the coach blew his whistle and he said, what just happened? How did you do that? And I said, I don't know, Horse Creek basketball. It's Horse Creek's kind of the rural area where I'm from. I started varsity my sophomore year. I had a bunch of seniors that hated me because I knocked out a senior. So I dedicated my life to lifting weights because I knew, <laughs> and I did. I had, to, I had to have a row with one of them, cool. and, I, and I had it. And he so that's how and why lifting he, weights. So yeah. those of you who, who don't know Randy Mills, when he came in to Lagodi High School, um, he was a strong, imposing figure, young. But a strong, imposing figure, and much of that came from, from weightlifting. I know we've got some pictures. You'll see them. But, uh, but that's where it started. Yeah. And it, it probably hasn't stopped. Has no, it? no. I still live. Yeah. Not, not nearly as much. I, it's all about staying mobile now. If I lift once a week, I don't lift heavy. If I had to do it again, I would not have lifted the same way. Uh, later on, and this was right at the cusp of leaving, uh, maybe the last few years at Lagodi, I started weight training athletes and, and teams. Uh, I, I developed a program for, for sports performance. And it wasn't how much you could lift, it was how you lifted. Was, was that a, a paid position or something that people came to you and you said, yeah, I'll help you out? Well, I started doing it on my own and uh, I was living in Jasper. All the time I taught at Lagodi, I lived in Jasper and a car pulled up to Lagodi. And it was going to church in Huntingburg. And uh, I was lifting with some of the people in, in the congregation. And one of them had connections with a high school. I started, I became their weight trainer for their football oh, okay. team. And they were runners up in the state that year. Okay. Well, because I lived in Jasper, the Jasper people started giving me a hard time. So I ended up being their weight trainer, football weight trainer for Jasper. No trainer? Yes. And then I did the high school there uh, for uh, Duncan, Gary Duncan. That would go, I started doing their basketball players. At Southridge? At, at Southridge, yeah. yes. And then people started coming out. I did some college students that came in because I, I, I uh, trained people out of the racket club there in Jasper, which was the weightlifting place. And I, I weight trained some, uh, some Lagodi people. Remember the Reed boy that, that was from Australia that stayed with the big suit? He, um, very good track? Yes. yes. I weight trained him for sports performance. Okay. And he said it improved his time. Yes, he was very a, good athlete. You know, he was a sprinter. Yeah. So I was, I was doing that. I was weight training people. And... Uh, Oh, I, I think, I, I can't remember the Lagodi guys I kind of did on the side that picked it up. Well, I did some of the baseball guys. Uh, Phil Eiler really got interested in that, as you remember. He was one of the strongest kids for his weight. I've well, there, seen. there's two. There was a Phil Erler and mm -hmm. there was a Phil Eiler. Both was were there, outstanding yeah. baseball players. Was there, right. Yeah, Phil, both were catchers, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Phil Erler would have been class of 76. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Phil Eiler later. After, yeah. Well, then it was Eiler. I was thinking it was, Earl. it was Patty's brother. Bill Irwin. Okay. Okay. So he, was, straight. so he was uh, older than you. He was 1976. Okay. Yes. Yes. So I was just weight training him just on the side because he liked to lift weights. That's yeah. what that was. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So that senior year, you, you get to your senior year and that, is that what? This is what this book is almost perfect season. Yes. Um, Bluford. You didn't have football at Bluford? Is that no, correct? No. Just like Lagodi, right? Yeah. Yeah. Or, or smaller. So that wasn't even 
something you could do, but yeah. I, bet, I bet you'd play. Well, I, the, Mount, the Mount Vernon people wanted me. Yeah. Because they had football. Yeah. They were they were the largest town there in Southern Illinois. Yeah. And I played basketball with those guys. I would go in my sophomore year. My dad started taking me in, and I would play in the summertime at the Mount Vernon gym. And a couple of those guys became NBA players. But that first five all went to Division One schools, and they were they went to the state finals. This is single class basketball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when I was a sophomore, I just loved to go in there and I'd knock them all over the place. Yeah. It, I, you know, <laughs> it reminds me of a story that Bill Butcher told about Wayne Flick. I know, I know you know Wayne very yes. well. And I think we were playing bar even and, and Bill, as Bill tells it anyway, that uh, Wayne goes up for a rebound, comes down, and there's four Vikings on the floor, one to the north, one to the south, one to the west, and one to the east. And that's what it sounds like yeah. when you go up for a rebound. Yeah, well, you, you spread yourself out. Yeah. And there's a trick to not getting called on the foul for that. And, and I think Wayne perfected it, and I perfected it. Yeah. Interestingly enough, Wayne's the first uh, Lagodi student I met when I brought my dad here. And uh, we can back up and talk about that story. Yeah. So my junior year, uh, after the, those seniors had graduated, uh, we were the starting five, and we won. We we were one and sixteen when I played uh, varsity my sophomore year. And by the way, I did very well there. I was uh, not always the leading scorer, but sometimes I was the leading scorer. Um, we we came close to to having about a break-even record, but we just lost in overtimes and all sorts of things like that. One of the best players left during that time, senior. Uh, but I loved it. That was probably my favorite year because there was no pressure. I'd never played on a I was playing varsity. Where did your dad get his passion for basketball? Did, did he so play? my dad came from, and I, I need to talk about the community where I came from. Mm -hmm. That community would, what would it be? It would be like Ruthven. And they had a two-year high school there that was formed during the Great Depression because those kids weren't going to school. It just, it was, we were too remote and isolated. The roads were so bad during that time. It wasn't hills. It was just bad roads and, and being a distance. We were in the corner of the county where three other corners met and so the the trading spots in all those county seats which are usually the center of the counties far away so in 1937 i think they they uh, built a little high school there it was a two-year high school that's where my dad went and they had a basketball team it was an outdoor court and of course so in was like indiana everybody loved to play basketball and then he went to mount vernon his last two years he drove and mount vernon had a uh, what it would be comfortable for around here, maybe like Jasper, very, very good football and basketball tradition in the state of Illinois and in Southern Illinois. And so there's a story I talk about in my book here where dad's hoping to make the team and their very famous coach at that time uh, uh, was, was there and was walking through the gym. And so dad was shooting foul shots. I think he did underhand during that time. Coach came up and said, how many do you think you can make? Because Dad was purposely the only one out there, he knew when the guy came through. Oh, okay. And and that's all I think eight out of eight out of ten. So show me. So I think Dad made one out of ten. Oh, <laughs> so there went his basketball. That's a show off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he but he was a World War II veteran. Yes, yes, yeah. World War II. And uh, but my dad never talked about anything. Never did. You know, I hear that so much yes. about World War II veterans. Uh, my grandfather was the same. Yes, guy. and. Uh, he died in 78 during the blizzard. I was coming here. Maybe that's why it impacted me so much coming up here because I was up, I'm like, almost crying. And it was during that time I would have lost my dad. Yeah. I was remembering where, where all the big snowbanks were coming up here, driving from Jasper yeah. and Lagodi. Today you're talking about yeah. whatever you're driving up. Yeah, yeah. Back to, yeah. yeah, not only Lagodi, but my, my dad too. Yeah. Wow. Because that was in 78. He was 53. Ooh. And, and died because of it. He worked for the Department of Transportation, had a heart attack mm. uh, there because it was so cold. So that didn't help because had he been older, he might have talked more. Yeah. For example, he, he, when he came back from the war, he married his sweetheart, his first wife, and they had a baby, and then she died. And uh, about a year later, he met my mom and, and, and had mm. us kids. What was that like? Yeah. He never talked about it. He had polio. He was completely paralyzed when he was 12 years old. He completely recovered. Our doctor said he was the only example of that that he knew of, where he completely recovered. Complete, he never talked about it. Yeah. 
You know, and, and that's amazing. And 53 is awful young to even think about that. But what I always propose to people, when you get a chance, somebody who is of meaning to you, they're older, do exactly what Dr. Mills and I are doing right now. Find yes. about, about their lives. Because you, you may know it. about it. You may know about it, but your grandchildren won't know about it. And I've had an opportunity <laughs> to do that with my father-in-law and with... My, my grandson has interviewed my dad, and that's on YouTube as well. So they're more apt to talk to grandkids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. That, that's probably right. But, but yeah, my grandfather, he was in World War II, and if you'd mention it, he'd just sit there, and maybe sometimes a tear come out of his eyes because it was serious, World War II, right? Yes. I mean, but, but regardless. Um, but, but, but I do always advocate, if you can do it, do it. So when I started getting the basketball, and when I was a – Freshman, no, when I was in eighth grade in a, in a county tournament, I saw my name the first time in a newspaper account because I scored 25 points. Whoa. And I've still got that. Well, I found it. My dad saved all my clippings. We started drawing close. He started coming to my games. He started talking to me. We'd have this kind of a breakdown after the game when we talk about the game and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I never rode the bus. I rode with my dad. So for the years that I played basketball, my dad and I were very, very, very close. And so, and basketball yes, brought you to that. So, junior year, uh, we won our first 11 games. The uh, Wayne City Holiday Tournament, 16 teams, is a big, small school tournament there. Uh, we were picked to win that. We went into that and had our the only game that I played with those guys that was so good. And I was just privileged to be on the team with them. So, I, I served that guy in the middle that nobody else could do. Right. But we had four scores. In my, the game my junior year, I was the fifth score. And I did not like the pressure. And I told the coach, I said, you know, I don't, we got enough score. We were making over 100 points two or three games back in, when they didn't have three-point shot. Right. Um, but anyway, uh, we lost, uh, we fell apart in one game. We were 12 points ahead with two minutes to go, and nobody won the ball. And they came back and beat us in the last second shot. And then we won third place. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the season was okay. Mm -hmm. In that junior year, up until the holiday tournament, everything was fine. And then I fell in love. Girls. Girls. And it's funny. I talk about this in this. And coaches know these things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I talk about <laughs> this in the book. I talk about we, we, got, that, we got that talk when I was a freshman. You know, don't be dating. I, oh, I, yeah. I don't like girls. Girls. So sophomore year, don't be dating. Oh, I don't yeah. like girls. And now, new coach my junior year. We got another I coach. I quit. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I, I thought oh. he gave us a talk. He said, that won't be a problem. Oh, I mean, that it, it came out of nowhere. Yeah. And I talk, yeah, I talk about how that happened in the book. And when I wrote the book, because she was ahead of me and then uh, uh, left and I didn't know where she was at, I thought, you know, I talk about her in the book. I got to find her and tell her, make sure she's okay with that. She might read the book. Yeah. And so I, I did and I found her and she was delighted that she oh, was going to be the... Did you mention her name in here? Yeah, but I changed it. You did? Yeah. And there, it's a little more complicated. Authors. It's a little more complicated yeah. than that. There were a couple of other guys there. You know, yeah. Didn't need to know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we stray. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But uh, so my junior year, yeah. we got attention because we were all coming back, and uh, the the dean of sports writers in Southern Illinois, at the Southern Illinois in Carbondale, Illinois, said we were the team to watch. He called us a little David team. That's a Milan team yeah. in Indiana. We were going to be- Is this Blueford High School? Yeah, yeah. We were going to be the next Milan. What were your nicknames? Uh, we were the Trojans. The Blueford Trojans. We were the Trojans. Yeah. So my senior year, um, we have a guy who had played my freshman year who was very good at-, at uh, He had a physique. He looked like Tar Tarzan. And he went up north, as we say in Southern Illinois, to DeKalb, Illinois, and he played football there. So he heard about all that we were accomplishing, and, and he, he had married then, and he came back with his wife as a senior and came back to be on the team again. Well, that just threw us all off because he played my position. Mm -hmm. So about the first three games, we, we weren't as smooth, and we lost our first game. Now, we had the longest winning streak in the state, so we won the rest of them. But we lost that first one. And the coach saw real quick, and he was, he was a nice guy, and I felt sorry for him because he ended up having to, to drop out. But uh, 
he was uh, he was a guy that was used to taking over the game and he'd just start shooting you know and i guess if you're making it fine if you're not it's not good but uh anyway that got straightened out and then we started rolling again and uh I, I found a, a niche that I was comfortable with. I was scoring in double figures, about 10 points. That was fine with me. But I was known for defense and uh, blocking shots. Getting a few boards. Yeah, getting a few boards. Uh, I remember uh, when we played for the conference championship uh, against the team at their place, uh, they didn't score. I don't think they scored until the end of the second quarter, right before the half. And the, uh, there was a guy from the Evansville Courier that picked us up. You know how, how sports reporters will find a really good small team and, and yeah. write it. Well, we were it. Yeah. And that was great because we were getting all these nice articles in there and got rated, too. And this, this is single-class basketball yeah. in Illinois when you got the big Chicago team. So you lost that one game. What about the tournament? How we do? So we went into the tournament. We won the district. We went into the next level. We won our first game. And then we came up against a team that had Doug Collins on it. Doug Collins. Got, yeah, got lead, lead, leading score in the in the state, yeah. and then leader scoring and leading score in the nation at yeah. Illinois State. A lot of people don't know that. Played professional basketball yeah. for the Philadelphia 76ers, and an Olympic hero. He's an Olympic hero. In 72. That's right. In the famous 72 yeah. Russian. Olympic so we were playing Benton, and uh, they were famous for I think Coach Heron, later on coached at Illinois University. They were like 87 and three in three years. Mm-hmm. They were good, yeah. and we were playing them. So, so Doug was on the tail end of that. They called him. They were the Rangers. They called him the Lone Ranger oh. because he the didn't. Right around he, sure. Yeah, yeah, he didn't have the supporting cast. Uh, and Mount Vernon ended up going to state that year. And those those guys, two of them, were just childhood friends to me. We always played basketball together, so I, I was very happy for them. But anyway, we had the ball, and we were uh, two goals down and had the ball and a chance to come up in two points. Of course, the place was rocking then. Yeah. And uh, I think we missed the shot. And then I think we ended up losing by eight points or something like that. So, that so was that's that. an almost perfect <clears throat> yes. season, right? Yes. Are you in this uh, cover here? I am. That's uh, that's me. You can you can see how thoughtful I am. You know, oh, I, I mean, I'm sitting. You were skinny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I was I was big. I mean, if you saw me, I was from the yeah, well, from a different wingspan, for yeah. Sure. I had wingspan, and I was very, I was strong. I mean, I was still lifting weights all through season. You know, if I had to do all it, late, for sure, if yeah. I had to do it over again, I would have been lifting correctly. Yeah. That's one reason why I think I dedicated myself to sports training because I thought, you know, I did the upper body. You don't yeah. shoot; you shoot with your legs. Yeah. You get your jump with your legs. Right. Well, let's get you to Lagoni, <clears throat> all right? Because that was your very first job, and 22 years old. 22 years old. Not exactly. Not what even you, 22 when I started. 21 going on 22. Oh goodness gracious. Not exactly what your dad wanted you to do. No, huh? no. Well, now we get back to the story. Yeah. So I'm graduated and I'm getting offers. Uh, back then, it's, this is in 69, the South hadn't opened up to letting blacks play. Right. So anybody from Southern Illinois or Southern Indiana that was any good at all was going to get out first from from all over the place. Yeah. So University of Tennessee at Martin, yeah. uh, it offered me a scholarship. I uh, some uh, two-year schools down there. Uh, Illinois College, uh, all the community colleges in Illinois, Greenville College offered me an academic scholarship. They were the Division Three, which was really took the place of a uh, sports scholarship because they knew I'd do okay academically. Yeah. My dad wanted me to go there and I sh- Greenville? at Greenville College because he could have continued to watch me because right. he came to all my games. Mm-hmm. And he kept, uh, as I said, I, when, when I was going through my stuff and we moved to Ferdinand, I found uh, all his clippings he had saved. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of them was how tall is Blueford. He got hung up on this. I was going to be 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> and he decided I was going to be 6'3". I was 6'2 and a half and I never got past it. He'd get so mad when they'd call me 6'2 two and 6'2 two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and I think finally some guy said 6'3", but that's what he was fishing for when he wrote that letter to the sports editor. Was he tall? Was he no, no, no. He was about 5'11". Oh, wow. there, there was no real height. My brother yeah. was 6'2". I was about 6'2 and a half. Uh, so I, that probably came back a little farther back. So my dad took me up to Greenville for a visit. 
And I should have known something was going on because no one lifted weights back then. And there was the whole team outside the gym underneath a tree with a makeshift bench press lifting weights. Yeah. And I thought, wow. Mm -hmm. And I came out and the coach came out, hey, yeah, we're just lifting weights. And later on, I figured out my dad told this guy, <laughs> I like to lift weights. Mm -hmm. And he had the guys out there lifting weights. Now, obviously, they were lifting and they wouldn't have had the weights. Yeah. But, but I think they wanted they, to make an impression on Yeah, them. yeah, they wanted to make an uh, yeah. impression. Well, yeah, it was fine. And there was a guy there that I didn't know. I was very involved in church work back then. Mm -hmm. And there was another guy that was that I knew of. I thought, okay, we'd have that in common. And he was a pretty good athlete. He was from McLeansboro, which we didn't play. I thought, well, there'd be somebody I would know. And uh, I went and talked to the head of the history department. And he had me to sit down in this chair. And he said, you know anything odd? And I said, yeah, my feet don't touch the ground. That was the chair of the world's tallest man from uh, Alton, Illinois, that he'd gotten a hold of. And so, well, right there, th that had me. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I go home and I just think, because I actually had depression during my, I mean, clinically okay. depressed during my senior year. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm calling it that without being diagnosed, but yeah. I, I know what clinical depression yeah. is. And yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't diagnose No, it. no, no. And, and that ran in the family anyway, yeah. because of that small community, there was a lot of people who were interrelated. I'm sure that's true around here as well. And uh, bipolar illness ran. I thought it was the norm because yeah. <laughs> you know, that's all I saw. Everybody. Grandma called it somebody being on while well, they're on one. They in the manic episode. But anyway, <laughs> we, we, we make jokes out of hard things. It's com sure. common to do in rural areas. So uh, I had a minister that had graduated from Oakland City University, which is the General Baptist. Uh, school, which was the denomination that we went to. And he said, hey, let's go to Oakland City. So you, I want you to see it. You might like it. And I, I don't want to go that Had you heard of Oakland City? Oh, yeah, yeah. But I just didn't want to go that far away from home. Now, a lot of the people that I admired, uh, younger men that I'd seen in church camp and so forth, were Oakland City graduates. And they were really super people. And, and so that, I knew that there was a culture there, something I could fit into. You know, being being religious doesn't work out in the fields either. <laughs> right. Yeah. As far as crew talk, and which is fine. You know, I mean, I was fine in culture. I can talk with the best of them. But anyway, so I go to Oakland City, and uh, I thought, my gosh, I, I met these people that were being tested, and they, they shared things in common with me, and they'd been in sports. You know, that's I didn't get that in the rural area. I mean, as long as I was around my sports buddies, when I go out in the hay fields and. I was the only yeah. one. So it counted for something, but it still wasn't the same. And uh, I, I remember the president of the university interviewed all of us that were uh, in competition for the main scholarship. And I remember the question he asked me. He said, what do you think about Eisenhower says there's an industrial military uh, complex that we need to be careful of in this country? Well, I just read an article in Newsweek or Time, so I I responded to it, and I guess in a fairly intelligent way. It probably <laughs> surprised him. So I went home, didn't think any more about it. And one day I came in from the hay fields, yeah, probably in May sometime. And mom said, this is a letter here from Oakland City for you. And I opened it, and I'd gotten that scholarship. Now, it was full tu tuition and fees, but it didn't pay for room and board. And my family, they didn't have a lot of money. Most people didn't. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that takes care of that. I, I can't go there. And my mom looked at me and she said, you're going to Oakland City. Okay. Yeah. Now, that was hard on my dad. And I did not play basketball there. I played intramurals. Mm -hmm. But I did not play basketball there. And uh, so I go to Oakland City. I get a, a uh, comprehensive degree in social studies, which allows me to teach any thing in social studies, not just history. And think about it. You got sociology, you got economics, you got current events, you got American history, you got world history. When I graduated, Greg, you couldn't find a job. As, as a teacher. As a teacher. Mm -hmm. I mean they were just rare. Mm -hmm. So I was interviewing over in Southern Illinois, which my dad was excited about. I was interviewing in Western K Kentucky, where my first wife was from, and then I was interviewing in Indiana because I was living in Oakland City at the time. I was 
was married and my wife was teaching. My first wife was teaching at Jasper. So uh, we were getting ready to go to Mount Vernon. My wife had been offered a job there. <laughs> Anytime I, I walked in and was interviewed, um, uh, superintendents would always say, because I had good grades, I, you know, they, know, they knew I could teach and I seemed to be personal and I was big. And they liked that. Yeah. We're going to find a place for you, you know, because they knew I could probably, you know, do okay with the students. That, that classroom control was tough. That, yeah. And so uh, uh, we were getting ready to go there. And I got a, I went up to Lagodi and I had an interview at Lagodi and an interview at Schultz. And uh, the Tracy Dust. Dr. Dust. Dr. Dr. Dust was at Lagodi. <clears throat> and he, uh, he, he, called me back and he said, and I, I remember I got interviewed with uh, Ms. Lester Page and he, he said, no, he's going to be the main guy. And they were very thorough. I mean, it just wasn't because I was big. They were very thorough. And they showed me around and they asked me very specific questions. And, and that was the most thorough examination I had. At 21 years old. Yeah, 21 years old. But, you know, I didn't know anything about Lagodi. Right. Had you heard of Lagodi growing up even? No. Or even through high school? No. There was a Lagodi, Illinois that's pronounced at Lagodi, I think, right. which was north of where I live. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Tracy said, you got the job. They were excited. I was excited because now I could stay in Jasper. Mm -hmm. And that looked like the, the route to go. And I really didn't want to go back to Southern Illinois. I knew that would not be a good choice for me because I needed to get away and become yeah. who I was going to become. Well, he called me up shortly after that, a couple of days, and he said, you need to come up and talk to me. You're talking about Dr. Dust? Mm -hmm. So I got there, and he said, this has never happened before, but the school board has changed their mind. There was somebody else that came in that had some pull, and they want this guy. Now, he, he never took the job, and he wasn't from around here, so I don't have to say his name and no, no one would know who it was. I'll tell you later. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I thought, my gosh, it's just devastating. Yeah. And, I, and I looked up, my dad was in politics and, and, and was good at it. He was a servant to the people. Mm -hmm. And I had learned some things from him and I said, you know what, Dr. Dust, I get it. It's not your fault. And I really appreciate what you've done for me. And it's okay. I'll find something. And you got a good school here. You could just tell how relieved he was. He said, oh my gosh. He said, I thought you were going to, you know, you're so big. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I said, no, no, it's okay. And I just took all the guilt away. I said, don't worry about it. I'll be fine. Because mm -hmm. it really bothered me. Yeah, he's a great guy. Well, about a week later, he called me. He said, you know, get your butt up here and sign the contract. Because the, the guy didn't take the job. Meanwhile, Shows called me right after Shine signed at Lagodi and offered me a job. No kidding. So I could have been at Shows. I came that close. I would have still been in Martin County, but it would have been a different world. Okay. So, you, so your dad impression, you got the job at Lagodi. He wasn't overly impressed. Oh, he knew nothing about Until it. he saw the facilities, right? Yes. So he's still upset. And he, him and mom come over here. And I said, well, let me take you up and show you my room and where I'm going to be teaching. Mm -hmm. Because I hadn't been in there much either. I hadn't really looked at that. When you walk in, yeah. you just. I was telling my wife this morning, because I don't think she's ever been into coming to Lagoda. I said, you know, the trophy cases are they're from yeah. top to bottom all over the place, yeah. and it's just chock full of stuff. Yes, yeah, so we're talking, what, fall of 73? Yes. Okay, so. Summer, late summer. Okay, okay, but we've, we've gone through some really good times the last few years. Yes, in yes. Fall. Yes. Yeah. And, I, you know, and I'm, I'm an perfect idiot. Perfect time to come. Yeah, perfect time to come. So I walk in there, and who do I meet? But Jeff Meyer and Wayne Flick. Jeff Meyer and Wayne Flick, class of 74. Yeah, and they're going to be my seniors. I don't know that. And so, mm -hmm. and we're just stunned, my dad and I, by all this, this trophy stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to look at that because we love basketball. I didn't, I didn't tell you that my dad was an was a expert at the history of Southern Illinois basketball. No. Uh, the Mount Vernon Rams had won back-to-back -back teams, mm -hmm. uh, and, we, and one of their teams is considered the best high school basketball team to ever play in Illinois. Okay. So there's a rich, rich, rich heritage there. The fabulous Fox, Jerry Sloan, the elegant who went to uh, played for the Chicago Bulls and coached uh, uh, for the Jazz. Yeah. 
Houston was part of our world. Yeah, with Evansville. Uh, with right. Evansville. The Elegant Elephant. What a name. He was my first hero. First high school basketball. This is all in my book. First high school basketball I, I, a game I went to. Harrisburg was playing Mount Vernon at the old Davenport gym in Harrisburg. And there was the Elegant Elephant. Uh, it was argued in the papers, you know, how, how much he weighed. Some said he weighed 285. Some said 245. He actually weighed 215. But he was so powerful. He had these huge legs and, and he had a beautiful shot. And he was just, it was just, when I left there, I thought, I want to do that, yeah. you know. And of course, he played for Harrisburg. I remember my dad just pulled me down by, by my shirt when I stood up and was cheering for this guy because it was just amazing to watch him, kind of like probably like watching Larry Bird. He ended up going to the University of Alabama, going south again. Who was it? Uh, Guy Lee Turner. What's the first name? Guy Lee Turner. Guy Lee Turner. Okay. Yeah, his dad, I think, ran the uh, television and radio station out at Harrisburg, Illinois. The elegant elegant. Oh, I'm not sure how mom would feel about that. <laughs> so he goes down there and he dies in a tragic accident, jumping in a swimming pool, probably drinking, and broke his neck. And that just so bothered me my sophomore year because I just really identified with me. And I was starting to have some issues then, I think, because I just didn't fit in. Mm -hmm. I look back and I can see what that was. When I first wrote my uh, autobiography, where I, I, I pulled out all the basketball stuff just for this book. The rest is about the farming and that other stuff. It was called, again, Not Like Your Father's People. And it was my attempt to get even with everybody. <laughs> and the more I wrote, the more I learned to love and kind of like I did with, with Dr. Dust. They, you know, they were wonderful to me. I just wasn't like them and they didn't know yeah. what to do with me. Yeah. So anyway, I take my dad in there and so that helps him come around. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Was he aware of Coach Butcher? No, no, but he, he got aware because I was calling him uh, mm -hmm. all the time and talking about the games because that was that 73-74 year. Mm -hmm. And the year of, of the iconic game that's in all of Larry Bird's biographies, every one of them. And there's like five or six of them out there. It has Lagodi, uh, the, 70, the 74, 73, 74 season Lagodi uh, Springs, Springs Valley, Valley game. Yeah. And it's, it was considered the classic game in basketball, the one that Larry wished he'd had back. Yeah. And I was at that game. I came in with Lee Cavanaugh, Lee Cavanaugh. I don't know what time we left, like three o'clock in the afternoon. He said, we got to get there. Yeah, he was right. And well, he was right, and I've talked to the Springs Valley side of that. Brad Bledsoe, who played on that team, who would have been a junior that year, uh, told me here recently in an interview I had with him that uh, when they were finishing up uh, with a PE class, uh, they were coming in the door. So what, it, the school wasn't even out, and they were coming in the door buying tickets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I don't doubt that at all. So it was packed when Lee and I got there, but we still found a seat. Yeah. Some people did, they were on the floor. Yes, they were on the floor. I've got a picture of that. So that's another book that you're working on. Yes. We'll talk about a little bit later with a lot of Lagodi connections. Yes. So we want to make sure we get to that. But uh, so you meet Wayne Flick, Jeff Meyer. Your dad now says, okay, we're good, right? And, and you're a teacher at Lagodi, 21 years old. How'd that first year go for you? What do you remember about that first year? Anything stand out? You know, I would use the word magical. Oh, good. It was so out of worldness yeah. because I'm new and everything's new and Lagodi's so interesting to me. You know, I was always interested. I just felt the ghost even when I was growing up, which is probably that melancholy side of things. Yeah. Uh, but I was interested in, in history wherever I was at because it just spoke to me. I knew that people were acting out of something that happened generations ago and I wanted to understand that. That's why I always enjoyed history. What we're doing this moment has been informed by things that happened generations ago that's been carried on down the line and it's fun to follow those back. So I saw very quickly the, not just Catholic, because I'd been living in a German Catholic community, but Irish Catholic yeah. in Lagodi, and it's a different Catholic. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And I had a couple of students that were uh, Quakers that were from the Paoli, Orange County area that were here. And so you had that world. Uh, you had, of course, the Amish and Mennonites and, and that sort of thing. And out my, you know, I remember where my room was back in the corner there, the junior high. 
you go, you go into the junior high and you turn right. It was in that corner. So when my windows were open, I could hear the clip clopping of, of okay. the Amish coming in the shop. And that was just like being in a time machine. And you appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yes. Or, or so. Yes. So there was all of that history. And then you throw in the frontier history, mm -hmm. which I've since become interested in. Mm -hmm. I'm, I have enough for a book. My Larry Bird book, not this one back, but I'm writing about the outlaw gangs of Indiana. And Martin County had, had a few. They had a few. Yeah. In fact, they had uh, Du Bois County and Martin County probably had the two most notorious ones now. They've been forgotten. And they, of course, the line was right there. They'd switch back and forth in that hilly part of Du Bois County there into Orange County. That little Lost, Lost River, Lost River area, right. area was where the, those gangs were, not just the Archers, but the Reeves gang there too. So, you know, I sense that uh, Civil War uh, kinds of stories there from the area that was picking up on. It was just, it had plenty of ghosts and then basketball. Mm -hmm. And just not basketball, but I would say the heart of the golden age of Indiana basketball was here in the in the 60s and 70s. Uh, so yeah, I was riding high on that. Now, students, I always love my students, and uh, these kids were wonderful. They were uh, much like where I came from but different, a little more urban because they were in a, in a town. And you had Crane Naval Base, throw that into the mix right. because then you had those people coming in who brought in that world of uh, uh, military as well, which was, I was interested in as my military history mm -hmm. that I've written show. But uh, so there was a gang of guys uh, who were, uh, to go into my understanding of why they were, rowdy the way they were but they weren't bad students but anyway let's just say they was they were rowdy so they would make noises when i first started teaching hip hip yeah. so i spotted him real quick and i put him in the four corners that had me running into the four corners <laughs> so it took me a couple of weeks to figure that out and Let me ask you something real yeah. quick because uh, i brought this up with with ann acker when we talked about giving the board Yes. Right? And I've always thought, if you had to give the board to somebody, but they were high school, we're talking high school. Yeah. So did, did you ever have to do that? I was hoping that wouldn't come up. Okay. Because <laughs> I am. My editing skills aren't good, so it's going to stay in. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do not like corporal punishment. Yeah. I think it's wrong now. Yeah. Uh, but when you're desperate and it's an option <laughs> and it works, yeah. it does work. But but I but do you look at Mrs. Rishisha and you look at my wife who's mm -hmm. the same size? She's about four foot eleven. Yeah. My wife, my second wife, mm -hmm. married to now, when she taught uh, high school, she had no trouble. Some some you can be that tall and come in and you can control the room. Right. Kids sense your vulnerabil vulnerabilities and they mistook mine for easy. Yeah. So it took me a little while. But but I was a big guy. I could just literally make my presence known. Did but you? that didn't always work. So I did use the board, yes. Yeah. Really? Okay. And I was, I was not, I didn't swing hard. Okay, not as forceful. It, yeah, yeah, it was not as forceful, but it was, it was humiliating enough. Yeah. And 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 I, it was, I would not have done it if I had to do it again because I, I saw I didn't need it. I will tell you a funny story though with, with the gang that was uh, yip yipping, yip yipping, yeah. and and they were fun. They were fun. My thing was. You don't give me any trouble, and I'm not going to give you any trouble. Mm -hmm. You show up and, and not bother my class, and, and you're probably going to get a C in here. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to still have to work, and I'll help you get a C. I'll give you extra credit. Yeah. Uh, and if you get a D, you know, you're probably going to go out and get a job and make more money than me anyway. You're going to pass. As long as you're not giving me trouble, I don't care, you know. And I was interested. I would ask people what they were doing. Yeah. And the back row guys, those were the guys I hung around with. So I, I, and I was 21. So I knew them. I was comfortable with them. I was, I think I heard you say one time, uh, Greg Johnson's thing, that I was a friend. Yeah. But, but, I, but I had, a, a, there was a wall there too. But yeah, I, I was a friend. Yeah. Uh, and so there was a group of guys that said, hey, you want to go in a wild cave? Yeah. So they took me into this cave. And I could name some of them. 
And it was uh, in Lost River there, right across the bridge. Um, and then that first turn to the left, I'd probably get there today. And boy, you talk about a wild cave. We had to crawl on our bellies for about probably 100 feet. And then it kind of opened up and you scooted on this big crack that you couldn't see down the bottom of. And then it opened up where you could walk and crawl. And so we went into that and we came out and they were kind of laughing. I said, what are you guys laughing about? I said, well, we weren't sure if we liked you or not. And if we didn't like you, we were going to leave you in there. <laughs> you said you could name them? <laughs> well, uh, Bernie Landon was Bernie, one. Bernie, <laughs> Bernie, Bernie. Hi, know, Bernie. He's the one who got me started on it. Yeah, 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 because he take. I think he's got pictures of that. I hope he destroyed them. <laughs> Bernie seems to come you know, up Do you know what you do when you're with a bunch of guys, you know, in the yeah. picture? Yeah. <laughs> Involves a, uh, yeah. the hand. Who, who, who else? Uh, do you remember? A couple of McAtees. I think Van. Van. Maybe oh. Steve. Um, Osborne. Maybe Tony. Maybe Tony. He was that. He would have been that. He would have been yeah. in that group, uh -huh. and maybe one other. I can't yeah. remember. But it was a nice group yeah. of guys. Later on, I took some guys in the cave, and I think it was uh, Van and Don Williams and another guy. We went up to Springville, mm -hmm. there in northern uh, Lawrence County, yeah, and we went in the cave, and we almost got flooded out. It was in the winter time. It wasn't supposed to come a thunderstorm, and the front came through. And it wasn't in the in the uh, uh, weather prediction either. And the water started rising on us. We we barely got out of there. Yeah. So that was fun. <laughs> so what what would I know? A lot of things are going on. And we'll talk about. But I'm just thinking, you were there ten years. What what did the 1983 Mr. Mills know that he wished he would have known in 1973, as far as education is concerned? Certainly, <laughs> corporal punishment would have been off the, yeah. off the list. Um, you know, I think what I did naturally with... So, students would act up and had to be dealt with. So, I, I, I wasn't gentle to them in front of the class. I would take them outside. So, the other students didn't know what was going on, right. which I think was a good move. Right. And I would say, are you okay? Because they were thinking, we're going to the office. Yeah. And I always heard their story. I don't know why in my gut. That was I, later in your, or was that during your entire tenure? That was when I started and I continued doing that. That's what I'm saying. I, I don't think I changed okay. much in that regard uh, as far as discipline, which is 80% of it, maybe 90. If you don't have discipline, you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. And well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, some funny stories. But uh, I always knew that there was something going on somewhere else. And they would, they would tell me, and I would say, okay, uh, maybe direct them to getting help and just say, you know, I understand, let's go back in there. And they, that's all I had to say. Yeah. And then they never typically bothered me again. Uh, I had students who, uh, I had a group of guys, I think they were in econ, and I can't remember when this was, probably halfway through the time. And they were a pretty good group of guys. Uh, there was a uh, crane in there, and uh, Alan Crane. No, no. Dee Dee. Oh, Dee Dee, sure. Uh, oh, I can't remember now, but but pretty nice guys. I never had any trouble with them. They were seniors. It was an econ class, and it was a rainy day, and they didn't want to talk about econ. They said, "Tell us some stories." So I said, oh, "Well, this is interesting. I'm going to tell you a story." An old guy told me out in the fields. Mm -hmm. We had been uh, rained out. Uh, I was uh, working for a dairy farmer, and I was uh, stacking behind a baler all day long. And we got rained out. We pulled in this barn, barn, and there was nothing else to do but to sit there. And so dairy farmers are 24-7, but nothing to do. You could just see him relax. And he started telling me Korean War stories. So he told me a Korean War story. But at the end of the Korean War, and he was a crew chief on a military plane, crew chief is the main guy. You don't fly if the crew chief says we don't fly because he packs the plane and he knows whether it's going to be safe or not. So he said they took a select group of us and gave us this test. And I must have passed because there was this room full of just a few of us. And we were going to be sent to Hanoi where the French were trying to keep uh, Vietnam from falling to the communists. And Hanoi was the capital at the time. 
the country had not been divided yet. This would have been in 53. And he was flying out of Hanoi, dropping supplies to the Indian who was the last battle of, of that, particularly the French left because they got defeated there. They got surrounded and they were flying in the supplies. And so I told them that story and they said, wow. So Dee uh, Dee Crane said, the next day he said, I told my dad that story. And he said he wanted to know who the guy was. And uh, I said, okay, I, I told him. And he came back. And uh, I said, was he the right guy? And he said, can I tell you what my dad said? And I said, sure. And he said, yeah, that was the son of a bitch. And then I said, yeah, that's the guy. <laughs> so they'd been over there together. No kidding. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. They'd been there together. They'd been in that elite group. Wow. Uh, so wow. a small world yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I had some, some girls who were seniors. They got senioritis. And I never got a handle on that. Really? Well, I couldn't. Yeah. Use my physical strength on right. them. They didn't. They were just done with it. I will not name any of them. But they were all great. They were all wonderful yeah. kids. But you know, and and that was frustrating for me. I think I I bent up a a uh, waste basket in front of them, and they just giggled. I thought, okay, if that doesn't work. That's it. You know, just don't go outside the room, okay? And that was probably the only time I felt, and that wasn't a, a, a bad deal at all. Uh, you, you said some funny stories regarding discipline. Was that one of them? Yes. Yeah, but you can't name names. Right. But you remember these names for the most part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Oh, yeah, they were they were all sweethearts. They were good. Very good. Yeah, they ended up doing very well. They weren't. I mean, they were the cream of the of their of their class. They well, just, obviously they were smart. Yeah. Well, you remember. They knew what they could get away with. It. Yeah, and you remember what senioritis is like that first no. lesson. So, another story, and I don't know whether they name this guy or not. But to show you how, you. how, how yeah. <laughs> hey Tim, don't be watching me. Between me and me. So uh, I, I'd given this test, and this kid yeah. who's very sharp yeah. comes up and slams the test down on my desk and says something bullshit or something. Yeah. This is test is just. I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, it's unfair. And I guess he was ready to go to the office over it. I said. Explain. Yeah. I was interested in it. I didn't get mad or anything. And everybody was questioning, real quiet. And then I got, kind of got relaxed. He said, well, you didn't teach all these things. You didn't cover all these things. Yeah. He said, show me. So here were three things. And I said, how many of you missed this, this, and this? Well, every hand went up. And I said, change that, mark it right. He was stunned. Yeah. He was stunned. Had, had you covered it, do you think? No, I had not. Oh, you had not. That's how I knew. Okay. I thought I had. I had not covered it. <laughs> So it was a fairness issue to me. And he was ready to, to uh, so, you know, we got kind of close. And, and this is how I remember the story that I'm going to tell now. So I was using Socratic dialogue in a class where you, when somebody asks you a question, you give a question back. Yeah. The, the ultimate one would be the one where uh, the, this, uh, the, the Pharisees uh, cornered Jesus about letting the, the, uh, his disciples uh, uh, do good work on, on the Sabbath because mm -hmm. that was against the law. And Jesus responded with a question. Are, are laws for man, you know, who are laws, what are laws for, you know, uh, to enforce or are they for to help people? Right. And if you remember that next part of the scriptures, and then they went out and figured out how they might crucify him because <laughs> he embarrassed them because obviously he turned the things and, and made them look uh, you know, bad right. in the eye of the public. So I, I, I taught this young man how to do Socratic dialogue. Well, he's really good at this. And then about two days later, he's not in class. He said, where's so-and-so? Oh, he got kicked out of school. He, he did this real weird thing with this teacher. Why well, did Socratic dialogue on this guy and embarrassed him? <laughs> so we'll just let that go. Yeah, yeah. Although, although I would like to talk to you about that further. Yeah, yeah, well, parents thought, there's all kinds of questions there. But uh, yeah. Okay, well, hey, some work out, some go. Right. Yeah. But what I remember about you, and, and, and I think you had told me in a phone conversation we had that it wasn't always the most popular thing with, with, with students' administration, but you would turn learning into dialogue. You'd turn it into participation. 
you you turn it into debate. And to me, and that's why I have you here, and that's why you had an impact on me. That's learning to me. Yes. But not everybody felt that way. Did they? No. Um, first of all, you're working with people who don't want to be there. Yeah. Uh, so you you really have to work at at the angles. For me, my my belief was that that you're here because of history. We're here because of history. We're in this classroom because of history. What we're going to go out and do is being shaped by history. What are our choices? You can only understand your choices if you understand the thing that's brought you to this moment here. And so history always had meaning to me. Well, a high school kid could care less about that. Some did probably, I don't know, a very small percentage. And they were, but if everybody else kept quiet, I would teach to those is mm -hmm. kind of how it ended up. Yeah. ended up being. But I would put the American Revolution on trial. Right. I would put the Civil War on trial. Yeah. Think, things that we have always learned as fact. Yes. Book. Yeah. Here are the good guys, here are the bad now guys. Now you're asking questions. Yeah. 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 There, there are no really would, would good guys today, or bad guys. Today is common. Yes. Right? You, because we question everything. Yes. Uh, but, but, but of course, now things are all tangled up in, in, yeah. in who controls the narrative. That's right. That's I, right. I, could, I, I don't know if I could do that. So now they're all safe and you're checking off Oh, did they? Did, what color shirt was Lincoln wearing at the Gettysburg yeah. Address? Oh, you got that. I don't. I don't think I could teach in that atmosphere. Yeah. So, getting back to my story, the kids who typically didn't do as well, you know, because we're going to do a trial. Okay, who's going to be the judge, the jury? You know, what are the facts? What are you going to try to get at? The ones that hadn't been doing as well in class oftentimes got really excited about that, and the other ones that were used to making a, A's by just memorizing and taking the test who ended up being very good students, and going to college and being good academics, panicked. And I got called into the office by Dr. or Mr. Page. And he said, hey, there's some kids here concerned about your class and their grades. And when I found out who it was and what it was, and I just back to them, they were going to get A's regardless. You're all going to get A's, relax. And they were fine after that. But, but, I, but I turned the world upside down. I changed. Yeah. The system as they understood. And they probably it. took that home. Yeah. Talk to their parents. Yeah, because they parents didn't know. Oh, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know how to do this. And here are these kids that normally don't do very well, and they're doing. I mean, yeah. it turned things upside down a yeah. little bit. And so I just let them know that that I wasn't mm -hmm. going to do anything yeah. about that. I, I do want to share with you one other thing that I learned probably toward the end of things when I started. So I was weightlifting, and I would come in. Uh, early in the morning to weight lift and they'd move the machine down to the basement. So this would have been in the early 80s. Yeah, so if most of you remember from that time frame, it was up in the corner as you came in to the entrance of the gym, right around that white corner for mm -hmm. years. But yes, at that point, they moved it down to the basement. And just trying in my mind, that's where it was. It was up in the corner. Yes. Yeah. And well, I'll tell another funny story about that. It goes into the quarter thing. So I had students that came up and asked, if I would work with them. Wait with them. Wait with them. And they were students who had been in trouble and were continuing to get into trouble. Yeah. Some of them, not all right. of them. And I started working with them. And I had a couple of people in the teacher's lounge told me I could not do that. Mm -hmm. And that that I was that was a mistake, that they were going to get stronger and meaner and that would be a problem. You mean because it would be physically strong? Yes, I, I assume maybe I was being nice to them. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and that didn't happen very much. We had a great, but, but in this case it did. And maybe there were kids that these teachers didn't like, and maybe they had reasons not to like right. them. I don't know. Uh, some of them were going down to junior high. They were mid-level high school and causing trouble down there. Maybe consider the bullets. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So I discovered... And I saw this consistently when I started weight training people, that you could teach them something that stayed with them the rest of their lives and changed their lives. It was self-esteem. They were being bullies because they didn't have self-esteem. And the way I weight trained people, they saw physique changes very quickly. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they weren't making trouble. I remember the principal coming in or calling me in one day about one student. He said, I don't know what you're doing with so-and-so. But keep it up. I've had ministers and all sorts of people coming to me and saying, you know, what have you done to change this guy? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was a self-esteem oh, issue. Sure, yeah. and, it, and, and so with that, and there's 
There's another story with that I'll tell you. Okay. Oh, later. yeah. You said, though, that it kind of gets back to this quarter mm -hmm. of which uh, many people remember Mr. Mills as bending a quarter. Now, two of them. Two, two quarters. Because, mm -hmm. you know, they wouldn't be satisfied with one. They'd want to see another. <laughs> I, was, I was prepared. I'll just put it that way. Well, well how did that all start? Um, it was, I had just started teaching, and I was still you know, I was big and strong, and I'd lift yeah. weights where people could see me, but, but I, I just kind of wanted to go over the edge on it. Okay. And I think somebody said, I bet he's strong enough to bend a quarter. No, he can't do it. Mm -hmm. And so in the lunchroom in the cafeteria, even Biggs was with me, I bent two quarters. When you say two quarters, you mean, yeah, there's one. That's all, I'm broke. That's all I got. But two together? No, like that. I did one, oh, and then, and then, and they, then they, they, oh, I don't believe it, do another, and I did another. All right. Wow, look at that. It's straight as an arrow. Yeah. Didn't well, do it this time. No. So, no, I just showed you. Okay, but, but, okay, let's talk about that. But, but that didn't end there, of course. So then I had people coming in from all over the place, bringing in spikes and things. I can bend this spike and wanting to fight me and stuff. Oh. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you really bent the quarter? Or was that... Is that, quarter, stupid, quarter, is that a stupid question? The, the quarter got bent. <laughs> the quarter got bent? That's the answer. And, yeah. and then there was, and I was ripping up telephone books. Yes, I and none that. of that happened. I mean, the, it's, the, the, things just exploded. The myth. Now, yeah. now, let me tell you what I what, that they saw me do that yeah. I was doing. Uh -huh. So on the bench press on that universal machine, it went up to 250, and then you had plates to make it 300. Yeah. I was doing reps. Probably 10 reps, good reps with that. I was, I was very strong. Mm -hmm. And so one day, some junior high kids were in there. And so on that weightlifting machine, there's a, a thing, a, a pipe, if you will, or a piece yeah. that goes from the back to the front, and it lifts like that. So you've got a fulcrum back there. Mm -hmm. And so the weights here... If, if you put them back in, you have to be heavier than actually the weight in order to be that exact right. weight because the further back you go, the, 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 the less weight it is because of leverage. So I had a bunch of kids. I don't know how many could line up on there, three or four. And I said, okay, add up all your weight and here's 300 pounds. Yeah. And I did some bench presses with them. Well, they were probably 25 pounds or something. They were just amazed. So there I was bench pressing, I don't know, a thousand pounds maybe. And I let that go, but I'm telling, I'm telling you all now. <laughs> Forty years later. Forty years later. Forty plus years later. So yeah, I, I was. I hope you feel better. Yeah, I did. Get them off your chest. Yeah, confession is good. They had a. <laughs> no. Remember the thing they had to do the uh, pull-ups. Oh yeah. I yeah. would tie fifty-pound weights on me. For me. I would tie a fifty-pound uh, 50 weight on oh, me and do pull-ups. I was, I was pretty strong. You're pretty strong. You're pretty. And strong. I noticed in that one picture, you know, I got really heavy. I got as heavy as I ever, as I ever got. I'm too heavy. After my dad died of a heart attack, mm -hmm. I went from probably 285 to two. I think I got down to 208 in about a year wow. running. I started running. Okay. Then. Still lifting and started running. And I changed my whole weight. That's when I got into weight training for athletes and okay. so forth. All right. <laughs> but, but I would say about teaching, to make my point about yeah. teaching, I was amazed at how I changed lives mm -hmm. from that simple thing when I couldn't do it in the classroom with this kid. Because that was my goal. I wanted to make a difference in their lives. Mm -hmm. And it was so clear. And those kids went on and did wow. Yeah. They did that's well. Right. That's, that's yeah. You and, and, and I think some of them were at a turning point. Because mm -hmm. I remember the principal, when they walked off, said, make sure he doesn't screw up. <laughs> the one. Because he's, he's, he'd used up all his, his sticks. And, yeah. Wow. Uh, of all these deceptions, I'm thinking when you told me I was the greatest student you ever had, I'm hardly believing it now. Well, that, 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 that was okay. true. Right. Okay. There, there's, there's one more I don't know if I want to admit to or me. not. <laughs> it might break too many hearts. I'll tell you afterwards. Oh, come on. Right. Well, whatever you want to do. I don't know. It's not, it's, okay. it's not a bad thing. It's not, we'll think about that. We'll okay. do that another time. Another time. All right. So uh, I do want to go back because I wanted to ask you, we'll get to the end of your career and, and moving on at high school, from high school, but uh, we'll talk about your, your wife, Roxanne, a little bit. Okay. Um, there's a picture, I believe, that I saw of her it was high school, college. It says sophomore Roxanne Hill, is that mm -hmm. right? Doing the splits. She was a cheerleader. Yeah. Could you do? Could you have done that? 
Oh, I was never very flexible. <laughs> no. <laughs> They're looking at it right now, and no way could you do that. Yeah. Or even anybody else. If yeah. you'd like. but, well, yeah. how they do that, and my grandkids, my granddaughters, are all very flexible like that, too. One of them's on a dance team. And yeah. but, but, but what I want to go is, because I think of you, obviously, you're a, a storyteller. I think of you as a, a romantic. Yes. So I want to kind of hear if you've got a story in regards to your courtship, your proposal in, in particular. Was there anything that you did that was unique in proposing? Or was there even a proposal? Oftentimes there's I, I think with Roxanne, um, and by the way, uh, they're her kids, her two daughters and my stepdaughters, they are related to Bruners here in town. Which Bruners? Uh, it would be Larry and Lisa Hembridge yeah. Bruners. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, who was the, the one that played basketball in 70? Paul Bruner. Yeah, Paul yeah. would have been, and, and, he would have been uh, the cousin. Pete, Pete Bruner. Um, yeah. Who was the lady that was, a, uh, that was the Bruner that was the uh, parade in Jackson, uh, uh, Johnny Jackson's wife? Uh, yeah, yeah. She, yeah. She oh, would, oh, like she, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She would be a, a cousin. Oh, there. So okay. it's that. It's that bunch. Okay. Really nice yeah. folks. But anyway, get, getting back to Roxanne, I I think the thing with us was that we were friends first. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's uh, not going to be an exciting ending here for the story, is there? Well, <laughs> friends, it, 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 it became romantic, obviously. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. but I I think that was made it important. And, and good to, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I actually wouldn't know where to begin. <laughs> well, I, pict I picture you climbing the ladder upstairs, you know, and pulling out the ring and, and whatever. You well, I, I will tell you this. Yeah. Uh, she's perfect, mm -hmm. and I don't make that up. Yeah. She is. She's just, she's very gentle. She's very kind. She's very, uh, I think, mental health wise. I mean, she, 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 there's no baggage there. You know, we all have baggage. And her mother was like that. And her daughters are like that. And her granddaughters. I think it's probably genetic, you know, because you see that. But it's a, it's a, it's a rare thing. Uh, she's, a, she's also a scholar. She's written, she, we've done two books together. She's done uh, several articles uh, on her own. And we picked up on the basketball history too. She's got a piece coming out. Uh, here in the spring about a lawyer that went over to Vietnam to uh, take the case of a Marine Corps guy from Evansville that they were going to give a death, death sentence to because of an atro atrocity that he'd been ordered to carry out. This is a true story. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And so she's, she's like me, she likes these yeah. stories that have meaning. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. wow. think, uh, okay, so, you know, I asked Kenny Greenwell that question. Uh, and I'm not sure if it was the proposal, but but the way he met his a lot of people around here meet them at the Ruskin in Jasper, uh -huh. right? So I don't know if you watched Kenny's, but uh, he said that there were there were ten young ladies, ten girls dancing around, and he was going to ask everyone until they said yes. <laughs> and, and the so first went, one said no. So he just went down the line. He went down the line. <laughs> Second one said yes, and they've been married over fifty years. <laughs> now he didn't ask her to marry her there, mm -hmm. but he asked her to dance. I, I do remember the first time Roxanne and, I, Roxanne and I met, we were talking about helping a couple of students. I mean, that... I, we I, had a lot in common. Yeah, I, we had a lot in common. And yeah. Very caring. She's been a wonderful, wonderful yeah. teacher. She's yeah, retired now. She, yeah. You know, she takes yeah. my breath away every time I look at her. Yeah. yeah. So it's good. And you've been married how long? We've been married 35 years. Yeah. Well, 34, we're, going, we're coming up on 35. Yeah, always people like yeah. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you an interesting story that involves Wayne Flick. Wayne Flick goes in and out of all my stories somehow. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're married in Oakland City. She's originally from Oakland City. Okay. And I'm taking my sons back to Jasper. And uh, because they, we get them on weekends, they stay with them, their, mm -hmm. their mother. And on the way home, and it's February, and it's like five below zero. And I'm driving pretty fast because mm -hmm. it's late. I'm wanting to get him home. And I get pulled over uh, between uh, Pike Central and Ireland. And I, and I pull over to the side road. And here comes the state police. And I over down the window. I said, oh, Mr. Mills, it's Wayne Flick. And he says, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm 
he's got married and taking the voice back. He says, well, slow down. That's, <laughs> That's it. That's all he said. I doubt that was normally his uh, routine. Well, right. no, yeah, yeah, exactly. But, yeah. No, Wayne, Wayne's a terrific friend of the family. He's a terrific friend of the community. Yes. Uh, still very involved from afar. In yeah, he's, he's helped me quite a bit on the, on the Larry Bird stuff, too, yeah. connecting me with people and yeah. telling me his story. So what, what we're going to do because of, of time, look, we've got six hours. You know, just like <laughs> that. Uh, we're going to end the session just a moment. I want to give him a chance to answer a couple of more questions. And, and then we're going to have another segment talking about the books, kind of a synopsis of each one of these books and, and, and maybe where the inspiration was from, if that's okay with you. Okay, yes. But I, I do want to... Because this is what I did after I left <sighs> Ligoti. I was writing some at Ligoti yeah. in, in like study halls and things. I was yeah. starting trying fiction and I yeah. said, ah, this isn't going to work. And, yeah. you know, it is. Wow. But so, so 40 years since you, you've been out of Ligoti and, and since then, I know you've obviously become an author. A distinguished professor at Oakland City. What's that mean? It's it's uh, it's rare. Yeah. I, I, you you don't even get a free meal out of it. But academically, it means you're the cream of, of yeah. that particular Maybe. place. You know, it's interesting. You're asking me about Dr. Mills, mm -hmm. and you and I have a doctorate. I'm not an MD. And uh, you got to be careful of that because, you know, you're on a plane and says, is there a doctor in the house? You do, you, you, that's not the kind of doctor you are. So you only use that kind of, an ac or I do in academic settings. I never use that any other place. A lot of people will, yeah. I'm a doctor. But uh, similar with distinguished professor, that probably means more to another academic. Oh, wow, you're a distinguished professor that does this. But it's a title. Yeah. yeah. So, so when you're on a plane and they say, is there a doctor in the house? You kind of say, well, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> you don't even raise your hand. No, no, you don't. You can get in trouble. You're actually, actually the third doctor that I've interviewed. One of them was a medical doctor, mm -hmm. Dr. Poirier, Dr. Brian Harmon, who's a superintendent yes. here. So you're telling me I don't listen. I have people like you on my show. Yeah. And they carry it. That's why I have people like you. But uh, also, uh, eight books. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, eight books. Mm -hmm. Um And then 2018, tell me a little bit about this. The Dorothy Riker Hoosier Historian Award by the Indiana Historical Society. That's their top award for an Indiana and, historian. And how did, how did that come about? The Indiana Historical Society has been very good to me. Mm -hmm. I started, when I started uh, publishing academic publications, and I've got publications in, in uh, uh, academic, in fact, I brought some of them show later, uh, magazines on history. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it, most of it to do with Indiana history. Well, the Indiana Historical Society is probably the best historical society in the country. They're heavily funded by uh, Lilly. So, and they've got a, a whole block of Indianapolis, a beautiful place. So they're a big deal. And uh, I started getting research grants. I got a research grant of $15,000 for this one. I got a research grant of $15,000 for that one. It's called a Clio grant and they're hard to get. Um, so, and I, then I started doing articles. They have some publications, and then this, these are Indiana Historical Society publications. So I started working with them with my stuff. Mm -hmm. I became an expert on some of their year uh, long exhibitions where they had actors. I was an expert on a couple of, well, one of them. Uh, I've been on panels there, I've given speeches there. They have a, 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 a yearly meeting of scholars. Got a you want to hear the funny story now on that? Sure, yeah. Okay. So I'm at the Indiana, Indiana Historical Society. I, I know everybody. I've, I've published articles in their two journals all over the place. Uh, and I'm going to be giving one of the talks at one of the meetings. So it's an all-day meeting. There might be 20 talks. You pick the one you go to. Scholars come. Uh, the public can come and you pick the meetings you're going to. So uh, I've got a meeting on this book. Uh, on Hoosiers in the Korean War. And I don't even prepare. Usually I prepare. You know how that is. You've got to prepare for a week to do five minutes of, of something. Uh, it just takes a lot. People don't see that. I'll, I'll pretend that I do, but go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> the preparation that goes. I didn't prepare for this oh, okay. because I knew it inside out. And I thought, oh, yeah. there's going to be two people there. <laughs> So I come in there, and right before the thing starts, they're going to have, they've got this famous keynote speaker. I think they were the Lincoln scholar. 
and they've got this big auditorium that holds about 400 people and the mayor's there and the governor and all the rich people that support it and so forth. And this lady comes up and she says, our keynote speaker just dropped out. You're going to be the keynote speaker. <laughs> Holy cow, Greg. I thought, oh no. And I said, wait a minute. I know this by heart. I'll just tell the story. I'll make them cry. I can make you cry. These are sad stories. Mm -hmm. But first I went in the bathroom to collect myself. Yeah. So, you know, I used the bathroom and do mm -hmm. some water face. I came out. Luckily, this lady saw me and she said, oh my God, she said, Zip up. <laughs> yeah. So I said a very light name, zip up. Yeah. So I had, there's my white shirt, you know, and you're up on the stage, which you're above. And I thought, oh, my but she God. caught you before. She caught me, thank God. So just to tell you how academics can be. So I get up there and, you know, I, I wing it and do it by heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I can see you do it. There, there's some poignant right. stories. So the stories carried me through. Yeah. 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 And so yeah. that was not. So we'll talk about that and also the, the connection to Lagodi and the Larry Bird Springs Valley book. And, and, and when that's coming out in another segment in, ju in just a little bit, we'll, we'll record again. But uh, I, I want to give you a chance, anything we didn't talk about or ask about, whether it's um, your life or life at Lagodi that you would hope I would have asked or you want to give any more confessions? <laughs> no, but I'll tell you plenty after we're done. Uh, and I'll tell you later too. Just in driving up here, from Jasper to Lagodi, I was almost overwhelmed yeah. with. You don't get you don't get this way very often with memories. Yeah. Well, you know, I know the ghosts, but I'm around them all the time. Yeah. You know, and so they don't sneak up on me. Yeah. But I'm overwhelmed. For example, after my dad died, and that was devastating for me because I I lost that connection to ever close up with all the questions I had for him. Yeah. And I was miserable and I, I went through some clinical depression during that time. And my mom said, well, she, she contacted my old high school coach that had me my freshman year that had brought up the guy to teach me how to shoot a jump shot. And she said, he's coming. He wants to go to a Lagodi basketball game. Yeah. So I took him to see a Lagodi basketball game. And that was so neat because, you know, he was a father figure to me. Yeah. And we all went up there. We watched Lagodi play basketball. Yeah. This place means a lot to you. Yeah, it does. It does. And, and I remember coming here, and, and Dad was okay after he saw what I was going to be at. And after that Larry Bird game, I called him. It was late, and I said, Dad, I just saw the best basketball game I've ever seen. No kidding. Oh, yeah. Well, you remember that game, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember very well. Yeah. yeah. So, Billy got the best of him. Yeah. That night. Uh, and there, there's, a, there's some narrative that got told wrong that I've corrected too in that that we'll talk about. Okay. Very good. Thank you so much yeah. for, for the education, for the memories. Okay. Very good. Because when, we, when I think, and I know a group of friends, when I think of, of Dr. Mills now, it, it's exactly as we said. It, it may have been somewhat unconventional, but, but those, that's what you learn. To me, that, that, that's how I learn. Not everybody's that way, I guess, but that's the way I learn. And I appreciate you and uh, you know, I talk about Ann Ackerman and, and those teachers just so much. And, and that's why you're here. You had an impact on me, and I know you had an impact on a lot of other people. So thanks for making the drive down. Yeah. It's a privilege to be here. Yeah. All right. So that's it for this session. But you're going to hopefully you'll watch another session of him talking about his books, kind of a narrative of each of the books. And uh, I'm excited about the Larry Bird book. Yeah, we'll talk about the Larry Bird book that's not out yet, but uh, uh, it, it, a lot of connection to Ligoti, so we'll do that in a moment. So, thanks for watching this edition of Getting to Know Your Indiana Neighbor with Dr. Randy Mills.